the way Jung, uh, Yuan, if you want to have it, just, uh, just send me an email, we can do that. No video. Okay. <laughs> no video. <laughs> uh, okay, it is eight o'clock a.m. in the east. Do you know where your children are? Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, today, as I have been for the last few weeks, I want to uh, talk about the conclusion of uh, revisioning transpersonal theory uh, by Jorge M. Ferrer. And um, just to mention again, that on February the 7th uh, at 1 p.m., uh, we will be having uh, Dr. Ferrer live uh, on, the, um, on this channel. And in a few minutes, I'll get you the link for the channel, but in any case, or for getting the notices, so you can discuss it with him. Now, Dr. Ferrer told me, uh, about a month ago that he actually has advanced beyond revisioning transpersonal theory uh, to this book, uh, Transperson or Participa Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Personal Essays in Psychology, Education and Religion. And he asked me to uh, prepare for his appearance uh, using this book, this new book, because he says he's evolved his theory more. Um, and that's reflected in the 2017 book. The book that I'm working with is a book that he wrote in 2002. And he, um, he, well, the book that I'm using today, Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, is really uh, an academic uh, ivory tower debate between uh, Dr. Ferrer and his um, and his colleagues in the California Institute of Integral Studies and in Integral Studies generally uh, and in Transpersonal Studies generally and. Um, and I'm not sure that we average people need to be worried about it um, because that, that was, uh, you know, ivory tower type stuff. <laughs> I guess that's what, the way I would put it. And uh, being an iconoclast that I am and it being early in the morning. Um, but there are, many profound things in revisioning transpersonal theory. And uh, I want to uh, talk about them today and see if I can get you excited about his February 7th appearance. And hopefully you'll be able to join us. Um, unfortunately for our friends in Asia, it's going to be at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but, um, but I can't do everything. So, and I probably will be, we'll probably be talking about his appearance for weeks after that. So I'm in the last chapter of um, revisioning transpersonal theory. And there's a subtitle here, which is beyond absolutism and relativism in spiritual studies. Now, what, what's he, first of all, talking about? Well, he's talking about two, uh, two poles of a philosophical uh, world. Uh, one pole is absolutism. In other words, okay, which re religion has it right and all the others are wrong? Um, that would be absolutism. Uh, or another way to talk about it is that all the um, all the philosophies, religious 
theological philosophies are holding on to an elephant like the famous committee that's trying to describe an elephant and they're all blind and one has the trunk and one has the has the tail and one has a leg and they're trying to describe well what's an elephant and um, obviously they all have different experiences of the elephant and the idea being that at some point they're going to be able to describe it well enough so that um, so that you can have a pretty good idea of what the elephant is well Dr. Freire um, surprised uh, Becca Tarnas uh, a couple decades ago, a decade ago, when he said to her that there's no elephant. And so the point is that, um, that there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute answer. And then the other end of the spectrum from that is uh, relativism of spiritual studies, which says, okay, well, which one? So we can accept all religions, um, but um, which one gets privilege, which is, which is better than the others? And, um, you know, so this is kind of the way um, the various theologians in my community get together once a month and they have an ecumenical breakfast or lunch together. And so there'll be several pastors, there'll be a Catholic priest, uh, there'll be a, a, a mullah perhaps and a, and a rabbi. And they have uh, lunch together and they talk about uh, their common issues. But then they go back to their congregations and they teach their religion as they always have. And they don't, nothing evolves from that. And so there's, so between those two extremes, one where there's an absolute truth and one where there is, uh, uh, you know, just toleration, but I'm gonna teach my religion my way in between those two extremes, uh, there is uh, where we have to live. And that's the participant. That's what Dr. Uh, Ferrer is talking about when he talks about the particip participatory turn. And, um, and that's where we live in this world because we all uh, come from some uh, cultural background and there's no one cultural background that is um, absolutely true for everybody. Uh, and we've tried that as human beings and we've uh, killed one another over differences in our uh, way of thinking. And it, uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't solve anything because you do that and then there's resentment in the next generation and so on. Good morning, Art, nice to see you this morning. I'm glad somebody's out there. <laughs> Happy New Year. Um, and so, um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to see if I can get through um, two of the last four pages of his book today, and we'll see how that works. So um, I'm going to just read it sentence by sentence and try to make sure that I, I'm clear at least about what he's saying. Okay, so the participatory turn can be seen as an attempt to pave a middle way between the scylla of an author, authoritarian absolutism and the charybdis of a self-contradictory and morally per pernicious relativism. Okay, now, uh, scylla and charybdis were um, monsters um, that Ulysses had to pass between during the Odyssey. And, and that's our problem in many philosophical questions because we have to uh, go between what this guy believes and what this guy believes. And, um, and you know, we have that 
problem in our politics and everything we do. And so example of that is um, right now in American politics, we have red states and blue states and um, I'm starting to wear purple uh, because I think that if we want to be American, we have to accept one another and then work out what is going to be best for our country going forward. And that means that nobody is completely right. And let's talk about um, uh, the problem of fascism versus communism. Okay, on fascism, that's pretty clear. Fascists want everything to be just right and uh, have very strict rules and, um, and you can't change from that. Well, the pro and so they make the, the trains run on time. Uh, as is typical in Germany, for example, or in Japan. Uh, but it doesn't give you room to live. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. And on the other side is the promise of communism. The promise of communism is um, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And so the obvious idea is you steal from the rich and give to the poor. The problem is that that never works because um, always in a society like that, um, an oligarchy will emerge. In other words, we end up having uh, very wealthy people and very poor people uh, in any sort of um, in any sort of governmental organization, and you know they tried this in Russia, gave it a good try for seventy years, and what they were doing was if people didn't want to uh, live that way, they would just kill them, and and uh, you know before long, then you ended up with. Uh, one book called Stalin, the Red Tsar, uh, because he basically became a, an emperor or a king and he was just murdering anybody that didn't agree with him. And of course we see the American president right now trying to do exactly that. But of course he doesn't have the uh, following uh, that Stalin and Hitler had. And so, um, and so he can't get it done. <laughs> Big Cat says America is a kleptocracy now. Yes, it, it certainly is where the, the rich are just grabbing all the money they can. And, you know, they talk about trillion dollar uh, giveaways, but uh, the American people hardly ever see any of the money. I mean, over the last year, uh, okay, we got $1,200, big deal, and maybe we'll get some more. Uh, I don't know what a cacistocracy, I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, you can't introduce new words to me, big words, <laughs> at this time in the morning. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyway, um, what, what I know, and as an example, because it happened to me, is that when we had the, um, the financial crisis in 2008, uh, hi, Nick, good to see you here today. Uh, when we had the fi financial crash in 2008, um, I lost all my money. I, I tried to pay my bills and uh, but I was already 65 years old or 62 or something like that and I couldn't get a job and I had to keep building my own job and uh, eventually I ran out of money and so uh, my home was foreclosed and it had nothing to do with me really it had to do with the banks being allowed to do whatever they wanted and so the U.S. federal government bailed them out 
to the tune of uh, $450 billion. And so basically all defaulted mortgages were already paid, but then they came and also took our homes away and got paid a second time, and the banks did. And so that's the type of, of situation we have where the rich um, just control the handles of power and, and the poor can't get around it. And they have us, the poor people, fighting about um, cultural issues that nobody really truly cares about, um, you know, issues like abortion or, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, whereas, whereas they get to keep all the money. And unfortunately, it just doesn't work. And I heard uh, Yo-Yo Ma make an interesting statement on, um, on CNN on New Year's Day. And he was asked, he, he was playing the cello, of course, and he played a lovely piece. And then he was asked why, you know, how, how can we measure how important uh, music is? And he said, well, some things in life can't be me measured. And that comes, came down to my uh, fa favorite homily, which is that we can't live in the logos. And so you, the way to identify it is if it can be measured or if an algorithm or statistics can be applied to anything, whatever it is, then it's in the logos. If it can't be measured, it's in your life. It's in the arrows. And so my point is that we don't live in the logos. The logos is simply our, the structure um, and, uh, you know, just an example, the cells in your body, although there are trillions of cells in your body, they aren't your life. They're only the building blocks of your life. And so they're the logos of your life. But your life um, can't be measured. And, and so the point is that uh, we actually live our lives uh, in the in the eros. We don't live it in the in the logos. We don't live it in that part of life that can be measured. We live it in that part of life that cannot be measured. And so, yes, uh, the chaos is here too. And so, the things that can be measured have been used over millennia to create our civilizations, uh, but they're not our life. And this is why scientists cannot explain um, life. They, they can describe a few features of life, such as the ability to reproduce, um, but they don't know why or how it actually occurs, and only to a certain extent. Miles says, I bought the Honorable Paul Hellyer's latest book, Liberation, it's about how a small group that get to create money, yeah, a nice way to make a living, yep. And and that's absolutely true. We, um, they're, you know, a very small group of our politicians and government leaders get to create the money and uh, there's there's actually no no national debt. It's a fiction, and um, it's just you know an organization that only exists in the minds of um, some very wealthy people. Uh, loans money, pretends that it loans money to the U.S. federal government, for example, and therefore. Uh, money is created on the accounts, and uh, and so you know it, it just it's not real, and it, it's just like the fact that okay they've they've scammed off lots of money uh, from the rest of us over the last um, hundred years, let's say, 
and a lot of it is in little green electrons in Swiss banks, but they can't eat it, okay? <laughs> and so <laughs> even though they can have accounts about it and pretend that it's real, um, eventually they have to find ways to use it because otherwise it's not real. It's just, it's just figments of imagination. Good morning, Jordan. Good morning, Skip. I saw your long email, but I have not had the courage to read it all because it was five. That's cool. Courage. Five might minutes be. to eight. And, and, uh, <laughs> courage might be the best word for it. Huh? What's that? Courage might be the best word for it. And <laughs> if, if I if I use a lot of words that people are like, oh, my. No, maybe I'll later. <laughs> well, I just didn't have time to read. No, I, I get it. And Good morning. It's eight o'clock in the morning or eight twenty now. So, yeah, I, <laughs> pardon, I'm late. Um, my my local mom and pop coffee shop um, had the mom have surgery and and so I had to go further down for coffee. So I see. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I have a coffee maker, so I made my own coffee. This well, morning. I do as well, but I, I like to support them, and it's yeah, just sure. one of those I. I should just set it when I go to bed and yeah. wake up to it, but this morning did not. Yeah, well, I've uh, I've got a new trick. I took my shower and shaved last night so that I didn't have to do it in the morning. It gave me a little more sleep. Um, so um, yeah, it's still pretty pretty good. A little bit of five o'clock shadow, but maybe I'll nice. Maybe I'll yeah, I, I kind of I, I was born with five o'clock shadow, and so I kind of that's why I grew a beard. Yeah. Um, it, so um, I just want to mention here on the video that um, at three p.m. today we will be having uh, Steve Buser, uh, who is the publisher, yes. one of the two publishers of Skyrim Publications, and he is going to introduce their new series on uh, the work of Marie-Louise von Franz. Mm -hmm. And that uh, is the collected works of Marie-Louise von Franz. It's going to be 28 volumes. And the first volume is going to issue tomorrow. Um, and it is about uh, fairy tales. And uh, so mm -hmm. Dr. Buser is going to talk with us about that. And um, about the whole project, which is going to take 10 years to complete. But um, that's today at 3 p.m. Uh, it will be live on this YouTube channel. And if you are on our, uh, our MailChimp list, you will have the link so that you could join the discussion. It's and I would encourage everyone to do so. Mary Louise von Franz is kind of Carl Jung too or Carl Jung 2.0, um, when she went into fairy tales, she, she played a whole nother game that was the same game, but was more depth. So there's yeah, so much well, she, there. She's sort of like the young whisperer. <laughs> young whisperer, when, I like that. When people couldn't <laughs> I like follow that. Carl Jung, they could listen to Mary Louise von nice. Franz. She... She was Edward Edinger before there was an Edward Edinger. Right. Okay, so on the YouTube channel, I'm going to put the link. Um, so this is the register uh, link, which is the MailChimp link. So if you want to get the notice about today's uh, discussion and others, uh, you can register there and join us this afternoon is going to be quite a good talk okay 2 so p.m eastern time instead 3 p.m u.s 3 eastern, time. eastern time yeah eastern u.s eastern time noon if you're in california so get your sandwich early and, and <laughs> uh, come and join us i'm sorry it's three o'clock in the morning for for nick <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I apologize for that nick but but yeah, I, I didn't make the world spherical. <laughs> okay, so we got, so Jordan, we got through the first sentence of this okay. last pat, part of Ferrer's uh, closing. And 
the thing about this book is I'm not very interested in the arguments that he was making to his fellow academics about what's transpersonal and stuff. Right. That, that was a lot of stuff that is in the ivory tower and probably mm -hmm. should stay there. <laughs> well, you know, but, you're right too, because there's a lot of, and, and you know, I, I go polish labic nightmare le level, but, um, and I can read him and follow along, but I also think, wow, well, I'm, wow, why would I want to read in the silo? Um, let's go out in the field. It's right. roomy. And, so, so, and yeah. so, the, so the point is that we have to, if we flip to the back of the book and see what the, what the conclusion is about, <laughs> then yeah, then see the we, end before we, we start, right? Yeah, then we can then we can start working our thinking up to what what we think about it. And so the first sentence is about the difference between um, spiritual absolutism, authoritarian absolutism, and self uh, contradiction and morally pernicious relativism. Okay, that's mm -hmm. the that's the two poles of what he's said and so his first which in, is what, in one sense the unconscious versus the conscious i mean I, it yeah i suppose that's true i mean i um so anyway i want to go on so he says i believe that the, this move is pivotal uh not for not only for spiritual studies but also for contemporary philosophy and science and this book would be incomplete without some final reflection about the complex difficulties involved in its under, undertaking. Now, the point that he's making here is that we are, um, we have to follow this middle path. And I was talking about the necessity of the middle path um, because for example, in politics, um, fascism and communism both lead to the same result, which is right. people getting murdered uh, because they, mm -hmm. they're not following the rules. Right. <laughs> and uh, in fascism, they, they just, uh, they don't, they simply um, make no bones about the rules. They say, you will do it this way and no other way. And, <laughs> nice accent. Right. And in the, on the communist side, they say, oh, everybody's going to be equal, except some are going to be more equal than others. And oh, by the way, they have the guns. <laughs> so, hey, right. And then the, the rare leaders that say, look, you sent nine people to kill me and I have captured all of them. Would you please just simply stop? And otherwise, I mean, so, yeah, but you're, you're absolutely on the point because those places comes to come to that absolutism right. where they're just going to, they're going to try to decide for everyone else. And, and, and that doesn't work. Right. And so we have to find the middle way. And this is why I'm wearing purple more these days. And, uh, and, you know, why it's important to me is that, you know, I served 23 years in the Marine Corps and never once did we have a political discussion? Um, and never once did I doubt any of my fellow Marines about anything except, well, nothing. I, I never, I never doubted my fellow Marines. If they were a right. Marine, then then they uh, were doing your team. A Marine. Your, they were a team. Your people. And but the Marines are a weapon and. And uh, they're a weapon that belongs to the president of the United States. And nobody that's a part of that weapon uh, doubts its efficacy. <laughs> well, you know, and, and in that regard, too, I mean, if you want to go fast, go alone. There's point. But in the military as well, if you want to go far, go together. Yeah. And there's that piece. Sure. All right. So, um, so this is the point that... Ferrer is getting to that we have to have this middle way. And he says, let me begin by admitting that going beyond absolutism and relativism is not an easy task. It calls us to transcend many strongly ingrained habits 
of our thinking and to participate in the mystery and paradox that pervade our universe. Okay, so the point is there is a mystery. Life itself is a mystery. Um, since you can't actually measure it uh, or apply an algorithm to it, uh, you, you can't explain life by the scientific method. And it never has been explained by the scientific method. So I was uh, mentioning earlier that Yo-Yo Ma was on CNN on New Year's Day. Yeah, that's such a good example. Yeah, and he says you can, uh, some things in life you can't measure. Well, if you can measure it or you can apply an algorithm to it, then it's not life by definition. Right. And that's what the logos is. And, uh, and so we have to start understanding that we've been having the logos crammed down our throats for the last 2000 years uh, because most theologians never read past John 1.1, 1, 1. but in John 1, 4, right. 4 to 5, John mentions uh, uh, light, the light and the life, which is uh, what Christ represented. And so we need both. We need, we need structure. That's what the Logos gives us is structure. Uh, but... Well, and Skip, I mean, John 4 and 5 then makes the indication that the Logos is the past and we can't no, live John there. John 1, 4 to 5. It's John 1, 4 to 5. It's not John 4 and 5. Well, yeah, well, John 1, but 4 and 5. Yeah. Verses 4 and 5. Um, it, it's in the past. And the pre I think Jung called it the eternal moment. And, and I call it the perpetual present. It's the same thing. Yeah. And we, we can't live there. Um, it's, the present is the confluence of the past and, and the future. And here we are. At 8 a.m., right. 8.33 a.m. on Sunday morning. Right. And so if we look back historically, uh, we see how the church, um, and I won't speak to other religions, but the church, um, you know, used its power of, of people not understanding this and not under, understanding the mystery mm. to, they gave structure to people. And so people were hungry for the structure and so they said oh okay well i guess these guys must know something i think i'll give them a little money and so right. the, mo the money <laughs> kept flowing in to the church and still does and therefore it's built palaces all over the world um right. and and yet that's still structure and so they're still selling john 1 1 mm -hmm. and it, it's and, such a good point to that how much transpires between John 1, 1 and John 1, 4, 5. Um, it, it, it's such, it, you've brought this up so many times and it does not get old because it simply expresses, actually, I think John 1, 1 to 4, 5 expresses the process. I mean, right. in its entirety. I mean, there's, there's almost all of individuation in that jump from one to four to five right and, and I, I was seeing i mean the place that i i really got it was when i saw this interview between bishop Barron, who's a youtube a celebrity in his own right and jordan peterson and right. bishop Barron is saying oh he's the chairman of uh committee of catholic bishops whose job it is to bring people back in the church right and the results of what he's doing is that they're losing six for every one they bring in All right. and i look at that result as a business executive and say <laughs> man you're fired as my sales manager yeah he's gone <laughs> thank and, you no longer employed uh, here thank you you're welcome and then he, the, the, then he sort of pensively thinks and he says, well, maybe we have to teach the catechism better. No, because the catechism is the logos. And, right. you know, you, if you're not succeeding by cramming the logos down people's throats, then, then you can't, doing it more isn't going to succeed more. Well, and, and that becomes Job going back to the ashes. 
after the story. And it's what's there's the four year old would say, no birthday cake. What's the point? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> OK, so so my my advice to Bishop Barron is that you have to go over to the arrows. Uh, Bishop, you have yes. to you have to connect your religion up with the lives of your actual parishioners. Then you're going to bring people back into the church. But so far, uh, they haven't grokked this. And well, and the thing is too that it's a wonderful point. And frankly, as a business manager, that's the point. That's how this restructures. That's how this redirects for profitability. And and. If the church doesn't know something about profitability, who does? I mean, they so <laughs> well, well, they know so, something the about is, it. Though, there's a point of value, and they've always yeah. had profitability, but now they have an opportunity for value. And yeah, the that's problem a good is, point. they have not had value, they have had manipulation and profitability, and yeah. their differences. And, they, and so, they were giving structure to human right. beings who needed structure. Right. And and that was enough to take take up all, all the energy and to to gather the money for 2000 years. But but an, now, an old teacher of mine said, when you see the carrot, cut the string. Yeah. And so you know? now now they've gotten to the point where human beings have a, a little bit different perspective uh, right. because we've had 500 years of the scientific method. And so those old stories don't work so well anymore. And now right. we now we have to have another way of thinking about the spiritual life. And and this so is my question point. I would ask um, it, moving forward would be. Um, are are you presented value or or are you presented another 500 years of deception? So, I mean, it, it's it, to me, it's, it's very much clarity of vision generated questions in regards to moving forward. Yeah, and that's we, a good point. Yep. And what, what's the value of it? Now, there right, is a exactly. value. Of value. It. And okay. building now, value is now, the best point of business. I, I definitely do not want to dis Catholicism or any other religion no. because they do have value. And the value is my little red ball here. Okay, we all live, we live in chaos right now. All of us live in chaos. We, we have way too much information for what we can deal with. And so we all need a place and a time that we can withdraw from the chaos and just think. If it's only for one hour a week, so be it. And, you know, now, now in the fullness, uh, you know, we, we're too too. Uh, too late smart you know <laughs> too soon old too late smart <laughs> now in the fullness of time i can see why in my early 30s when i was a deacon of the reformed church um, i couldn't explain it and neither could my pastor by the way but after going to church on sunday morning i felt better and right. And now I'm convinced that that one hour a week was pull, was me pulling out of the chaos, you know, making stopping the chaos around the house by dressing the kids up so they'd All shut right. up, right? Sticking them in Sunday school so that somebody else was taking care of them and just going into church and going through a, a few rituals. That's enough to pull you out of the chaos, to let you recharge to um to contemplate life itself and, and if i may right there you were enacting capital in nature because nature is a consummate confluence it is always coming together it is never going apart and when you did that it wasn't about order it was about familial structure it was about nature it was about how things relate the relationships yeah. and that's that's so ever important i mean and if i back up to military discipline of the ritual right. no religion is wrong 
It's all about mastery leads to further discovery. And in the discipline of the ritual, there's action. And that right. to me is the key thing is you acted that Sunday morning. You brought everything together. It, it, it doesn't feel to me to be about order so much as it has to be about sequence and fluidity of life. Yeah. And it, it, it's about um, living life. Having yes, life. but living uh, and living is the best in action. And uh, we have uh, Miles, you Miles, Patricia, Oleg, and Manuela, and the big cat. Uh, nice. On, and Art. On, uh, why are they up so early? I don't I know. We were I don't know why Miles is up so early. My God, Miles. It's, <laughs> I it's thought we were the only two insane people. In the morning Where's the living? counterbalance? You guys should be yeah. asleep. Yeah. Anyway, Happy New Year's to you happy all new year's, guys. And, uh, happy new year's right especially manuela i mean wow you're 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 in another hemisphere yeah, right and manuela makes a good comment that silence at the church is such a blessing and yes. that is the blessing yes okay? and that's and the point is and of course the eastern religions know this from uh, meditation and having gone toward meditation um all you know, most of them went toward meditation and, um, you know, the, the Western way of doing it was different, but they, they all amount to meditation. That's what prayer is after all. Right. And silence being so different, capital S silence, than quiet. Yeah. Um, it, it's a matter of, it, it's, to me, it's the, it's the glass top of a pond. Yeah. Happy new year, Nick. To Happy to Nick, hear Nick. Nick Nick Chan is here too. Thank you. Nick. He's the he's the he's one of the ones that I that I get up at this hour for because in in uh, Singapore it's uh, it's like seven. No, six? it's it's nine forty three in the evening, I believe, if I'm not wrong. And uh, so Oleg says, Carl Jung said in the New Eon and Era we should take and bring old Christian values te plus teachings. So we should not forget about Christianity, for Christianity, but we must leave old in institutions. Yeah. And so I, I think I that know, actually I don't know if we're ever going to get away with leading, leaving old institutions that, you know, the church is going to have something to say about that. But the, but as Edward Edinger put it, uh, Oleg, is that uh, all of the world's religions have to be updated to, uh, to account for mo modern categories of understanding. And that's where we are. So, you know, and I would add that T.S. Eliot said, good poets borrow and great poets steal. And Christianity is just a giant heist from paganism, which is a giant heist from Egyptian, etc. which down to the dawn of our time, we've always done this. And so I think now is the time for un the next iteration of what are we going to be done this kind of what, thing. What are we going to be tomorrow? Yeah, that, what are we? That is the right. question. My, my grandmother used to have a saying, she said, there are only two days a year that you can't do anything. And that is yesterday and tomorrow. So let's go play tennis. And, yeah. and that works. Sure. Okay. So reading on with Ferrer, I've gotten through uh, eight lines. <laughs> okay. It calls us to overcome deeply rooted fears and to humbly encounter uncertainty and complexity. Now, this is this is the point that we um, we have to accept in life uncertainty and complexity. It, it's there, um, you know, and um, you know, it's it's one thing to you know have you know have a complaint about racial attitudes or whatever it is, but you know, there we are. I mean, there we can't change it. I can't change the color of my skin and nobody else can either. And so we, they, they are part of life and we have to accept that uh, 
complexity and the uncertainty that applies to it and figure out how we are going to learn to live together. Because, I mean, just in my lifetime, um, the world was terribly separated. I went to Japan when I was 15 years old and I never spoke to my grandparents uh, for two and a half years. And, um, and there was just this, you know, wall of distance between uh, Japan and the US. And that was in 62 to 64. But, uh, and, it, and it could, that distance could be crossed even then. One time, only one time, while my parents were still in Japan, but I had come back, I was able to speak to my father on the phone uh, from the US, but that call had to go through the Pentagon, literally. I had to go right. to the Pentagon and sit in flag plot, which is the nerve center of the Navy, and make a phone call through the fleet communication system. And it was a three minute call. And uh, it was just to tell them that I was alive uh, after a auto accident. And that's the only thing that penetrated that distance. But today, uh, we just operate in the same world. We have, uh, I don't know exactly where Oleg lives, but presumably in, in, uh, in the east somewhere, uh, east of here anyway. And uh, we have Miles in Canada. We have Manuela in Argentina. We have Nick in Singapore uh, and uh, other countries represented. And, um, and so uh, we can talk to one another every day, all day. And that's such a different world than, than existed only uh, 60 years ago. So it's a changed world. Um, and, and I have to say, I mean, when you, when you read the, he calls us to uncertainty and complexity. Um, and especially with the story that you just recounted, um, I always say, don't waste trouble. I always look for the workability. I don't get conned by the pro con game. But you read, I think it was six weeks ago, out of Alejandro Jodorowsky speaking about the chariot. And his chariot said, I made diamond out of my misfortune. Mm -hmm. And there is that looking into running to the bullets, looking into what's the source and looking into not what can I opportunistically greedily get from this. It's how do I make the what the momentum mori, you know, the death of the moment, the, the carpe diem, what can I get right now actionably? And it's not a get, it's an what can I act? And and there's difference. It's it's almost respecting the giver more than the gift. And okay, so uh, going on now, um, it calls us to simultaneously admit against absolutism that there is not a single true story and against relativism that some stories are better than others and that some may be plainly distorting and problematic. And so that, you know, would suggest that, you know, um, you know, the, in our racial problems, obviously, um, the story of Van Jones, who is a black man who uh, just goes on living his life in a very professional way uh, as an American uh, versus someone who is uh, still fighting the Civil War. Um, there's there's a vast difference there and the reality is that we all have to grow up and have to live with what we've got and van jones clearly has done that uh let's see you know mark twain speaks to the no true story with of course truth is stranger than fiction because okay. fiction has to make sense so the truth okay. really does 
So in, in keeping with our issue about logos versus arrows, Oleg says to Jordan, you are pronouncing Yodorovsky wrong. It's not, oh. it's not Godorovsky, but it should be Hodorovsky. <laughs> well, that, I thank you. I thank you. Because the uh, J has always been problematic with me between Spanish and Latin and English with a Hodorowski, Yodorowski, Godorowski. And so you're saying it is, repeat that if you would, Skip. Hodorowski. It's Ho. Okay. It's, it's like Jogma. Ho. Uh, so it's Hodorowski. Thank you very much, Oleg. That's, I appreciate that, especially yeah, says, from my studies in the Spanish in Latin. language. Language J sounds uh, sounds and pronounced like uh, H. Um, right. Yes, um, that's why. So, yeah, I it's, it's That's why, why I pronounce Jorge as Jorge and not as uh, George. Okay. Well, I, I really like that. Thank you, Oleg, because Hodorowski. That's even better because to me, Hodorowski is quite a jalapeno. Um, I really think he's pretty hot. So that's awesome. Thank you. But the, this is a case in point also, okay? Mm -hmm. Because to the extent that we have to correct one another uh, based on the logos, um, we, we've got a problem, okay? Because life, mm -hmm. life is about conveying the idea of what Horowski was saying. And, and so if we get um, off on the logos of, oh, you pronounce it this way, um, we're, we're missing the point. We're, except we're correcting that, our fellow man instead of getting the point. Well, except that there's FM and FM stereo, and there's a band across the FM stereo on top of it. And so to me, I, I fully agree, Skip. I fully agree. And on top of that, I will add that then the, his correction tunes my direction. It doesn't change my direction, but it certainly clarifies my direction. And I think that's an important concept as well. So uh, Oleg says, I know this because Hodorowsky is Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian surname. Okay, well, thank you, Oleg. And, and, and um, so Oleg, I'm, do I'm you also know not about being. Jose Plesnik, the architect? Pardon? Oleg, do you know about Jose Plesnik, the Slav architect? Yeah. Is okay. a question. I, a anyway, that's a anyway. diversion. <laughs> okay. so, let's, thank let's, you, Oleg. Let's stick on the topic. So, Oleg, at the same time, um, I appreciate the, the teaching point here, uh, which is it's entirely appropriate to be uh, correcting someone in pronunciation when you're in a Spanish class. Okay, that's entirely appropriate because then you're trying to learn how that language is intended to be spoken by the native speakers of that language. Um, and, um, and, but today we're talking about spirituality, which is on the other side of the of uh, this, the divide between logos and eros, and so. Um, and, and I'll add to counterpoint, Skip, on on purpose. Um, I appreciate wholeheartedly what Skip just put forth, and at the same time, going deep, I like to be tuned. So I I really appreciate the clarity. I. Yeah. I it's subtle okay, and yeah. it's not going to go far right now, but 10 miles from now, it'll be a different target. So thank you, Oleg. Thank you very much. Right. And so that's part of what life is about. Okay. And part of what the whole issue that I'm trying to address is about. We've right. gone way off the deep end on the logos and, and we have to retune ourselves to have balance between the logos and the eros. There's a time and place for everything. And, and we, have to, we have to live in this, um, in this middle way, which is, right. which is uh, Ferrer's next sentence. So let me read that. Let's go. And, admittedly, to dwell on the razor's edge of such a middle way 
can be perplexing and distressing, as we've seen in an example just now, especially in the context of a cultural matrix, still bewitched by the hubris of absolutist metaphysics and constrained by the assumptions of the Cartesian Kantian legacy. Okay, so. The problem um, of the mystic in modern culture or any culture is what that to me says. Right, well, it, and so I think it comes down to what Yo-Yo Ma said, which is if you mm -hmm. can measure it, put it in an algorithm uh, or you apply the scientific method to it, then it's logos. But right. if, it, if, it's, if it can't be measured, if you, if you can't uh, measure the value of a two-year-old smile, uh, then maybe that's part that's life and we have to get on with life you know and, and uh, you know, you know, Moss right there said and some things do not need words yeah and they, that's right and they can't be measured and and as you said yes you don't need words for music okay music. well and that's the point i mean it, it, that's i think that's why it moves us so much it's, right but it's... also popular music does have words and so being able to um, being able to listen to a, a, a folk song and hear the words to it can be very meaningful, right? And it's the play of both sides. It's both the logos and the eros when that's happening. And well, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll purport to present an example to me that's a little dyslexic, but from my anecdotal perspective would be um, there are songs that I loved for years and I never heard the words. I would sing along, but like George O'Keefe, why do you paint your flowers so big to force people to see? And I never saw the words. And then it never fails. One day, decades later, I hear the words and I go, oh, that's the source of that problem because I've actually been reciting discipline of the ritual, this syncopation of a verse that becomes in the sense of belief that I didn't even know. And then when I hear them, I go, Oh, don't listen to that song anymore. Oh my, Oh, Oh my word. And so yeah. it's interesting to me, the, the forwards and backwards of how words can enter and leave or, be rejected or be totally nourishingly absorbed from music. So music is a carrier. So when Yo-Yo Ma this last week said, some things do not need words, it made so much sense to me, not in a belief, but a deep knowing, like Jung and do I believe in God? I have no need of that when he did that gig, um, where this was how the logos got those words into my noggin. And, and now there's a different bouncer or maitre d', so to speak, at the door that says, well, I'm going to listen a little more intently before I enjoy that music. And so the, it's, 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 a funny, it's a funny trick there with uh, what's our true story. I think it's the last part of no true so story of that. That so when the when the music is so loud and chaotic that you cannot hear the words, uh, then you've gone off the deep end on the other side. You have to have a balance uh, between the two, and and so music can be extremely structured, like a minuet, and you can. You know, you can watch somebody doing a minuet, and it's so structured, and you know, where, where's the meaning in that? Well, okay, maybe it's some sort of, some sort of uh, mating ritual or something like that. Well, yeah, <laughs> go with the feathers. But, yeah. but on the other hand, you can blow your mind away and just go out and, and just move and shout and scream and, and so on. But well, and even in but between, not, though, when it's not just necessarily heavy. good either. And so the paradox is you have to find that middle ground. 
<clears throat> well, and what I what I think my point too, though, besides the middle ground, is the resonant ground, because when I hear a beat or, say, for example, Digital Daggers, the the, the band, they're kind of a, a different um, different than the Korean group. I mean, that's taken so much storm to the world, but they're almost just as young in, and the thing is. She or he could sing almost anything, and I'd be like bopping along, going, "Wow, why did I hook myself on this path?" Because the music gets me, and it—I mean, the Pied Piper is a story, you know. You know, you're playing on the flute, blah 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 blah, and here come everything behind him. Here comes everything behind him. So, I think the music will—the music provides a magnet. And well, the, 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 I think the all, quality all and the value piece here. is the words that are put on top of it. Yeah, Oleg observes, without music, life would be a mistake, according to Nietzsche. Yeah, um, well, yeah, and, Nietzsche said that very definitely, and right, I, I but, could not but agree. Miles with. reminds me of um, uh, the quote from David Bohm that Debbie and I love, David Bohm being a quantum physicist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that quote is, um, what is the universe? It's, it's, uh, unbroken wholeness and constant flowing motion. Okay. That's and what the universe is. Uh, and besides uh, beauty, um, I will then now not counterpoint. I will marry that with the four character voice of the universe is A-U-M. And people say, well, Jordan, that's only three characters. And there's the fourth character that is, that is the unsaid silence between and all around the AU OM. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's a whole gig on both of those there. Well, there's a, there's a whole religion around that. So we're not, yeah, there, there sure is. But, but it's, uh, but our lives, just think of your own life. Everybody's life is, unbroken wholeness in constant flowing motion. That's what everybody's life is. And um, and that's the arrows, okay? So um, it, when, you, when you start to put any sort of boundary around it, then you're getting into the logos. Max says, uh, Max, says a love supreme by john coltrane is very jungian music widely accepted in the jazz world as highly spiritual music we say john was channeling straight from the tap so to speak and actually that's what jazz is too um and uh And then Oleg reminds us that beauty will save the world, according to Dostoevsky. And Dostoevsky was basically pointing out one of the sephira in, in the uh, tree of life, I think, <laughs> which is beauty. Okay. And, yes, three. And so, so in terms of life, though, I wanted to, this idea came to my mind this morning. You know why do people have more than one child okay why did do, why does a woman after she's experienced the pain of childbirth why does she have a second child even think about it and the answer is that when when your first child is two years old they con they con you into having another one okay they're so cute that you say oh i got i have another one Jordan, what are you doing with your camera? This is really weird. <laughs> Having... I'm, I'm, I'm responding to a chat. Okay, because it's very weird. <laughs> uh, I, I guess, I guess, yeah, you guys, you got the. I guess you're, you're on a cell um, phone or something. No, my iPad won't charge the keyboard, so I'm having to type on the screen. Oh, um, I see. I see. I see. Okay, I get it. Uh, <laughs> It's very yeah, weird. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not playing some kind of mesmerizing focus, focus. game. That, no, okay. I, now that now that I look over to the side, I'm like, wow, that is kind of weird. 
Okay. Okay, so Ferreira goes on. As we have seen, however, many of the disconcerting paradoxes involved in going beyond absolutism and relativism may be more apparent than real. More precisely, they only emerge when these attempts are considered within an absolutist universe of discourse and dissolve when approached from alternate paradigms of understanding, such as the participatory one introduced here, meaning introduced in this book. And so, uh, you know, I guess the point is, uh, you just have to let it go. You have to let go right. of the absolutist and the relativist approach and you know, find what's right for you in your life. And that automatically brings you into a middle place. I mean, if you're, if you're an absolutist, um, you know, so what if the trains don't always run on time? Uh, well, uh, I experienced that in Japan one time when, uh, I was on the platform in Yokohama one night, late at night, and um, the train didn't come. And it was not, and then there was more and more somber activity on the platform, but I was too, I wasn't speaking Japanese enough to understand what was going on and people were getting more and more somber. And I got to my, I, finally, a train did come about an hour and a half late, and I got to my destination, and the, the station had a throng of people in it. And the reason is that um, there had been a train wreck, and something like almost 200 people have been killed, I think. Uh, and uh, it, fortunately, it, it had happened a couple of stations before Yokohama, so I didn't see this train wreck. But I step out of the station and hear this throng of people and people greeting their loved ones and so on, and very happy. And um, I had no idea what had happened. And I got home to my father, got home to my house, and my father told me that there had been this train wreck. So. Um, so sometimes you do want the trains to run on time. <laughs> right, because the, yeah, because that means regret and grief yeah. did not occur. And uh, Oleg says, I, I guess that Skip knows a little Japanese. Yes, you can be sure of that. <laughs> I think we would probably run Kanji's uh, Ku through Tao and Skip would just not miss a beat. Uh, yeah, well, um, let, let, let me, I'll tell you a, a story I mean, about my, start court, here my courtship. And end up here. Yeah, sometimes people say to me that they speak Japanese and, uh, and I say, Dokuni Benke Shimashtaka. Uh, and I, Pulled, which means where did where did you study, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, pardon me, I, I pulled I pulled me. that one out when oh, when boy. my wife, my current wife, now for thirty five years, um, I I pulled that one out on her, and she she comes back to me in beautiful J Japanese woman's language, and sent me to my dictionary then i knew that i was in trouble uh, <laughs> right what did she she's, say she's the Maybe only westerner she's the only westerner uh in my lifetime that that responded in japanese to the point where i had to go look it up may i ask what what she said um i think the the term was pera pera, 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 pera. or pera pera but i i uh 
it it <laughs> refers to something about relativism, as mm -hmm. I recall. But I yeah, mean, this goes back she, 35 years now. So well, I'm, she cross checked I mean, you, checkmate in two moves. That was beautiful. Yeah, that's right. I was decapitated <laughs> right then. <laughs> well, that's a pretty <laughs> that's pretty poetic, I have to say, because I mean. Uh, the kanjis aren't going to get that. Yeah, so and uh, on excellent. the other hand, uh, for my Chinese followers, <laughs> um, because I did I did study Chinese and was told at one point that I I could pass for it when I was in Taiwan, and I spoke Chinese on the telephone. People thought I was actually Chinese, but from Beijing because I learned. Uh, Beijing Hua, and um, and so nowadays I just write it off with a little poem, which is Tian Bu Pa Di Bu Pa Jiu Pa Yang Gui Zi Shua Guan Hua, and what it, what does that mean? <laughs> don't fear heaven, don't fear hell, <laughs> o o only fear foreign running dogs <laughs> speak oh, mandarin oh boy I, you know skip i have to i have to return serve i i don't have a texas accent and i'm from texas and when i was in france for an extended period people go oh jr jr and i'm like what do you mean you have texas accent in french and i i didn't get it but when i just well, I, my Texas accent that didn't exist would show up when I spoke French. So I, I, I think it's funny your poem there. Um, would you repeat it, please? Chen bu pa, di bu pa, jiu pa yang wei zi shua guan hua. And I probably, my, I now pronounce it like an American. I, yeah, well, no, that's, you know, yeah, when you're I, not, you're when not I studied speed, Jap I Chinese and in, from a, native speaking Chinese woman, um, I definitely had a, a Beijing accent. Um, and, um, you know, just to give you an example, the word restaurant in Chinese in Taiwan is fangguan, but in Fung Beijing one. it's fangguar. And- Yeah, fangguan, fangguar, exactly. It's different. Yeah. And so anyway, moving on. <clears throat> Here I would like to add that even in the case that some of the self-referential or paradoxical nature of non-absolutist approaches would still remain in these alternative paradigms of understanding, this does not necessarily mean that they should be dismissed as contradictory. To be sure, to turn paradoxes into self-contradictory statements is tempting, but I would argue that the transpersonal eye may see in this more a retreat into Cartesian habits of thinking rather than, for example, a movement toward trans, uh, trans conceptual and contemplative modes of cognition. I'm not sure I know what he said there. Did you get it? Well, I, I kind of think I do immediately. And I think what it was, was all we are doing is turning the steering wheel. We are not moving to a different country, hyperspace button style. We are simply turning with everything we've had behind us. We are turning, but we're turning a new direction, is, it seems. And it, at the very least, I think he's pointing to a new perspective. Yeah. Um, that may be on the horizon, not maybe enacted yet, but at least looking for that star, eternal hope, next brightness. Yeah, and we have, um, you know, we've been steering hard over to the logos, to the rational, right, uh, for the last two thousand years, and and so it it has given politicians the ability to write women off as as insane or you know you know we can't let women in because they're chaotic well the the truth is that um life is chaotic and their nature and capital n yeah and they're part of it and we're part of it and this was just a way for powerful men to keep control and it had nothing to do with the 
with reality per se, but now we're realizing it. Now this is the emergence of the feminine. We're seeing it and it's not that the feminine wasn't always there. It was the feminine, the feminine was being kept down by mm -hmm. very rational guys who, who made rules that made it tough for them to get through. We're still seeing that in, for example, the Georgia election, which is coming up in two days, where, right. where um, you know, powerful people are trying to suppress the vote of uh, Black Americans. And, um, you know, that's, that's what powerful people do. They try to keep power any way they can. And, you know, this is what uh, our current president is doing. He's he's got power, and so he's using it to raise money and what have you. And uh, he will continue to do it. Will it remains to be seen what will happen after he leaves office? Because uh, people keep suggesting that he may not leave office, and and uh, that is not the case because uh, his term officially ends at noon on uh, January the 20th, uh, whether he likes it or not, because that's in the constitution. And uh, unless there's, uh, if there's no clear uh, agreement, and this applies to Pence's term also. So if there's no clear agreement on who the next president will be, the president will be Nancy Pelosi. It's very right. simple. It uh, just drops she, down in, into, right, right, into, and so uh, you bring up a great point, though, about the, the logos being enacted upon women and things being put upon women over time. And and I'm going to I'm going to flip that turtle because I want to open it up to one simple thing. Uh, I, I'm not typically political. I, I don't publicly state politics, but to me, there there should be just as many rules governing women's bodies as men's and that number is absolutely zero <laughs> yeah okay so you know and so that's a perfect example of how the logos is interfering right. because uh, it know, puts upon rather than enacting with well and it, it it's the devil's trick okay because right. it creates dissension where there need be none okay for example right uh, my That's daughter the... and i can't get along on the on the topic of abortion uh because you know she thinks it's terrible that that little babies in the womb might die um and she did she never heard me say that I think that too. I agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, uh, I think that women should have the right to make their own choice about it. Number one, it's a terrible choice and either way. Um, and, and, uh, and if we're going to insist on bringing a child into the world, then we have to accept the responsibility of that child living a decent life. And yes, and actually from deadline and from intense martial conflict, uh, I, I come to a concept of crisis mongering where some people will stir the pot in such a way that everyone's in chaos no one has a clear direction about anything. And that's a method of control. It's a strategy. Sure it is. Sure it is. But, a, but the bad. joke I come to at the end of it is, okay, sir, um, those who stir the shit pot are required to lick the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> okay. What's the next so, sentence? Pardon? What's the next sentence? <laughs> From a transpersonal perspective, that is, the movement beyond absolutism and relativism can be seen not as self-contradictory, but as paradoxical. As paradoxical, the issues at it raises cannot be completely solved in the arena of formal bivalent 
logic or by uh, newer, mm. improved, or more encompassing paradigms. Although paradoxes cannot be conceptually solved, they can be transcended uh, in the realm of human action and experience. And so the reason that's important is that's what neurosis is about, okay? This is, this is the fundamental thing that relates to neurosis, which is in neurosis, you have two choices, abortion or no abortion or whatever it is, and you can't get out of it because as long as you're going to one or the other extreme, um, there's no solution. And there is no solution, okay? There is no solution by definition. And this is why this issue can be a per perennial topic. But, and so that's a, a neurosis in our politics and politicians play on that. But what is the solution to a neurosis? Okay, what do, um, what do therapists do to fix a neurosis? Okay, well, the answer is that there is no cure. Uh, there is no cure for a neurosis. But um, what happens in the psyche is that the neurotic patient learns to draw a fence around it to circumscribe it and put it off to one side and say, okay, that's one I can't solve <laughs> and, Well, I, and move it's, on. It's not actually, I, I think so enigmatic. I mean, I'm looking forward to Ferrer getting out of his difficulty, getting out of the dualism and getting to a consummate interdependence um, because the neuroses, once the trauma behind it is solved, releases it and it's gone and as if without thought or will and and both and there also is now i will counterpoint myself and say you're right there's no way to relieve the neuroses it's going to be present you compartmentalize it so i mean there's the military aspect of well put but that you, aside. you grow beyond it you mature beyond it right uh, and so it can become I mean, a cyst inside that you've put apart or right it can be put into the garden like compost. It's one or the other. Um, but either way, I, I feel like in that, in that sentence, I felt Ferrer really speaking from the silo, almost begging for someone to throw him a rope and say, pull me out of this dualism, please. I'm tired of explaining well, he, myself. He's, he's at it, out of it if... I can go on, then then we'll we'll okay. get to that. Okay. Okay. But I'm I'm just trying I'm, to I'm make, kinda, I'm, kinda I'm only trying to make a point right now, about right. neurosis and what neurosis is, where you have two choices. You you have you're in love with this guy or this guy, which one are you gonna marry? That's a neurosis. And it's true. And then there's always the third option. And when you learn that there's always a third option, and when someone says A or B, you always make up a C just to make sure A or B are actually right. worth a damn. Right. And, and, um, and so that's what thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Are, there you go. Synthesis you go is always C. And, exactly. Synthesis, and synthesis is, 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 third is represented by the symbol. Uh, right. whatever it is. So if you're trying to decide between two boy boyfriends, uh, you're ultimately you decide one and then the third thing uh, is the synthesis, which is you can marry one and, and have a love affair going with the other on the side or you can do neither, not do that and have right. a happy marriage. And, uh, you know, and both of those are solutions that can work depending on who you are and right. what you believe in so anyway. it's a matter what what you are committed to enact okay um so so ferrer goes on in my opinion for example many of the paradoxes raised by non-absolutist approaches disappear when one realizes that rather than philosophical positions to be logically defended in an absolutist domain of discourse, they are attitudes 
they, their attitudes towards life and other human beings characterized by both an openness to understand and be enriched by what is different and a surrendering to the mystery that one can never be fully apprehended by the mind. As attitudes toward life rather than as philosophical positions, these approaches can be criticized but not refuted. And here is where the potential transformative power of paradox truly emerges. Paradoxes are doorways to transpersonal ways of being because by ineluctably and often humorously showing the limits of rational logical thinking, uh, they invite us to expand our consciousness and enter the space of trans, uh, transrational modes of being and cognition. And so, you know, this would be, um, you know, if you're trying to decide between the two boyfriends, um, you can be happy by um, being um, loyal to, to the one you decide to marry, or you can also be happy um, by marrying one and having a love affair with the other. Both can lead to happiness and both can lead to, um, to unhappiness. And so it's, it's up to us in each day that we live to decide how we're going to live. And that's a paradox and how that happiness comes is a mystery. Okay. Well, you know, I, I, that whole paragraph and I, after this, my make this statement, I, I would love if you would read it again, because there's, there's a whole once upon a time, the whole life story, then comma the end there, because in the beginning he's in the silo and he has an absolute or absolutism problem with certainty but then he comes to his own paradoxes and doorways and then he moves out into self okay. would you I, mind I'm reading not, that again yes and I'm, I, I'm i would mind because he sums it up in the next paragraph okay and so i want to move toward the end of this session by going into the next paragraph which is his summation really of the entire book and um, and it, it has a subtitle a more okay. relaxed a more relaxed spiritual universalism okay okay and so here's what he says and the, this uh, I will re I'm going to read the entire paragraph and then I'm going to come back to the four points he makes. He makes and before points. you do, I will, I will say, could you say the title again? A More Relaxed Spiritual Universalism. That is actually a groundbreaking title for the silo. That title itself says, I am different than you and you guys need to follow me out of this hole. Um, so please. Well, I mean, it, it's saying no. Chill, it's so, chill, it's such guys. a positive. No, such I, a positive. I mean, thing spiritual, because... spiritual universalism suggests that there is an elephant, and he's saying there's no elephant. Okay. Well, but then he says a a more relaxed. There are two articles in front of a noun, and um, it's not it's not reductionist. Blah 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 blah. Lots of nouns and verbs a more relaxed spiritual universalism. That's such an actual layman's way of saying something. And to me, it makes it a beautiful topic heading. So uh, pardon, oh, but I, I really, I, I really I read with the that. paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> I would appreciate it if you would, and I would just shut my trap. Yeah. Okay. And it's actually this paragraph that led me to want to, talk about this book at all several weeks ago. Nice. And um, so we're finally up to that, to this paragraph. And there is a, there are two more pages in the book after this paragraph, but I just want to put this out on the table. All right, so here it is. In this book, I have introduced a participatory spiritual pluralism as a more adequate metaphysical framework than the perennialist typical, 
than the perennialism typical of most transpersonal works. If I have argued so forcefully for spiritual pluralism, it is because one, a naive or rigid universalism has been generally taken for granted in transpersonal studies. Two, I believe that pluralism should be the starting point of interfaith inquiry and dialogue. Um, three, pluralism is more consistent with my own participatory understanding of spiritual states of discernment. And four, conceiving a plurality of spiritual liberations and ultimates not only is more generous in recognizing but also can foster the infinite creativity of the spirit. Although for these and other reasons, my work emphasizes the metaphysical plurality of spiritual worlds, I should stress here that I do not believe that either pluralism or universalism per se are spiritually superior or more evolved. And it is now time to make explicit the kind of spiritual universalism implicit in the participatory vision. Now, I'm not going to get to that last sentence part because that's what the next two pages are about. But let's just cover his. Four yeah, that's lines. that's that's an important that's an important segment right there, because that's get rid of the isms and get to what you're getting to. OK, so. I'm going to go back and read up through point one. Okay. In this book, I have introduced a participatory spiritual pluralism as a more adequate metaphysical framework than the perennialism typical of most transpersonal works. If I have argued so forcibly for spiritual pluralism, it is because one, a naive or rigid universalism has been generally taken for granted in transpersonal studies. Okay, so mm -hmm. what he's saying there in point one is that all these guys, these guys at the California Institute of Integral Studies and all these people, uh, Jeffrey Mishlov and Ken Wilbur and so on, uh, have made an assumption uh, that there, uh, that there is an elephant in the end, okay? That, um, you know, it's a naive and rigid <laughs> universalism has been generally taken for granted in transpersonal studies. So in other words, what they're saying is all religions have the same basic ideas in them. And mm -hmm. it's a question of teasing those out and pointing out that they're all, they're all the same in one way or another. Yeah, okay, but that's naive. This is what mm -hmm. what uh, what Ferrer is saying. Um, which and is, he's also taken a gardener's approach because you're you're absolutely on the money that teasing them out is naive because teasing them out is just a further logic, if P then Q. The reality though, first year roots, second year foliage, third year roots and flowers, fourth year naturalization. That's the path of the perennial. So when he uses the perennial there, he is coming out of that. I planted seeds. I saw leaves. I had fruit. And now I have a garden. And there's truth in that last part of I have a garden. Yeah. Um, and did everybody catch that metaphor? Of I, <laughs> pardon, I, I, I speak a metaphor and I, I can't speak English. It's, it's, it's a problem. Um, all right, well, explain your metaphor then. So the metaphor to me is the first year roots. You, you trim the leaves, you drive the energy to the roots. The second year foliage, any flowers and fruits you, you trim off, drive the energy to the leaves. Again, discipline of the ritual, one, two, we're going to go through to four, three, third year flowers and fruits you allow the fruits and the flowers because now they're strong enough to hold themselves up they have graduated from the ground basically and then the fourth year they come up wherever they need to and wherever they want to 
And that's the naturalization of a garden. So to me, the discipline of the ritual across three years in a garden with a gardener, not telling your dahlias to hurry, because if they could speak English, they would just laugh at you. So it's the kind of thing where to me, the metaphor is the discipline of the ritual long-term. And when he says the perennial and a more relaxed spiritual universalism, meaning across the board, guys, chill the out. And, and what happens is it becomes the pluralism of out of many, one, and then all similar, each unique. If that kind of unpacks the metaphor message somewhat clearly. Right. But when you're making a garden, you, uh, you, it's like creating civilization, right? Uh, oh, if, that's a wonderful way to put it. You know, if, you, uh, if you're making a garden and you're putting a fence around it and you're, and you're cultivating it and so on, you're, you are rationally um, creating a civilization and I... we need civilization. Okay, and mm -hmm. that's one point. Okay, the, uh, but we don't need a rigid civilization per se. You know, not all not all all weeds need to be pulled in order to get tomatoes. Right, and um, and weeds are simply those plants we choose not to name. Yeah, absolutely. That's the racism um, of gardening, as I call it, but. <laughs> Miles makes a comment. Gardeners are friends of plants until it's time for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am. Thank you, Miles. I forgot. Okay, I'm that, hungry. I'm hungry right now. Sorry, Skip. I got to go. I, I've got some spinach to. to... <laughs> oh, Miles. That's. Wow. That, that, Miles, my, that's perfect. Cross but... check, checkmate. My double yeah. standard. No, oh, yeah, look at my beautiful the, garden. Now I'm going to eat it. It's like, okay. Yeah, the, it's I'm like the, into a the, church predator. Was, the church was the friend of uh, their parishioners and, yeah. until the parishioners didn't uh, pay their tithes. And yeah, well, exactly. I mean, so, okay, now I will, I will forever now not think of myself as anything other than a gardener predator. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Miles, for destroying so, my illusion. So in the church, if you didn't tithe your boy, you're going to hell. My. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, you wear a tie to learn to tithe is what I always heard. So. Oh, Miles. Okay. All right. Point two. I believe that pluralism should be the starting point of interfaith <laughs> inquiry and dialogue. Well, okay. We've got... Can that, you read that again? I'm sorry. I'm still, okay. I'm, I'm still laughing that I'm in a predator movie and I'm in my garden going, oh, how beautiful while I'm killing things. So could you please read that sentence again? All right. Two, I believe that pluralism should be the starting point of interfaith inquiry and dialogue. Okay. So we've got that starting point. I mean, the, the rabbis, the priests, the pastors, and the mullahs do get together for lunch, but the, they don't take anything out of it, okay? They, they have peace among them, but they, what they haven't taken from, from them is, hey, maybe there's some good ideas in this other religion that we haven't, that we could in, incorporate too. For example, <clears throat> my, <clears throat> my best example is uh, that the Muslims, uh, pray four times, five times a day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what could be wrong with that? Right. <laughs> why isn't, why Just isn't another that, ritual? Why isn't that a good idea? Okay. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be five, maybe it could be three or seven, who knows. But, but the idea is we're living in this chaos ball and we have to step back from it every so often. And, and, you can't stay in your seat all day. You you can't get over focused, and that keeps that keeps their life in something bigger and outside of themselves, in themselves. Even well, if it they, you, it keeps you in a life. If if you're well, always right, living right. by other people's rules, you know, don't <clears throat> don't be late for work, and you can only have thirty minutes for lunch type thing. 
Uh, well, you know, you're you're not having a life; you're having somebody else's life. Right. So i I'd like to I'd like to interject a, a small joke here that goes right along with these words um, in regards to language. Now, people not punctuating, people um, letting autocorrect drive their life. Um, so, a priest and a pastor and a rabbit walk into a bar. And the bartender walks up to the rabbit and leans in and says, what do you have? And he goes, nothing. I'm only here because of autocorrect. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. It was, I got right. that one. Number three, pluralism is more consistent with my own participatory understanding of spiritual states of discernment. Okay, so I think we can leave number three right. to Dr. Ferrer because this is his position. That's where he is, right. And he's sticking to it, or at least now in fairness. Well, can you read that this, again, though? Because it's this, the shortest one, where, too. This is where he was in 2002. So in fairness, in my interactions with Dr. Ferrer, he said that he has his thinking. Move forward, it, right. Move forward. Okay, and so when we get to the... Can you read three again, though? Would yes, you please? I will, but when we get to the discussion with Dr. Ferrer, this right. is the book we're going to be discussing, exactly. which is his book he wrote 15 years later, right. Participation, Participation and the Mystery, Transpersonal Essays in Psychological Education and Religion. And... Um, you know, this is this is a very very powerful book, and this morning. Uh, we well, have, I love in the second have, book he's bounced off. He he yeah, he springboarded we, from where he was. Yeah, and and so um, anyway, th this is where he was, and this is the the point in which he says, "This is where I am." Okay, so number three. Pluralism is more consistent with my own participatory understanding of spiritual states of discernment. Okay, mm -hmm. so understanding spiritual, the spiritual life, which is actually our life. Okay, right. It's the arrows, and um, because there's nothing spiritual about anything that's in the logos, if it can be measured or. Uh, apply an algorithm applied to it or it can be observed then that's not life that's low well, and when he says spiritual states of discernment that's a conscious swimming lapse in the unconscious yeah and i mean and that's so beautiful the the quote that i like to talk about this is okay logos words whatever the rules are etc um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Okay. So you right. can put a bridle on a horse. You can tame its wildness, etc. You can force them to come over to the water trough, but life comes from his drinking the water and you can't right. force him to drink the water. Right. And so. And even further than that, the centaur, for example, the, the horse slash man, the saddle is redundant. The torso divine is seated in the beast. So you get the both and, and that altogether, that's that horse that will or will not drink um, right there at the leading edge. Okay. Okay. So number four, conceiving a plurality of spiritual liberations and ultimates, not only is more generous in recognizing, but also can foster the infinite creativity of the spirit. Okay, so it, I'll read that again. Conceiving a plurality of spiritual liberations and ultimates not only is more generous in recognizing, but also can foster the infinite creativity of the spirit. And that's the point. Okay, we mm -hmm. look around the world and the spirit, which runs through all of us, the force, if you will, um, 
is infinitely creative. This is the point of our doodling exercise and our mark of the self that we've been doing with Colleen Kiber, which is, it is infinitely creative. And uh, so you can have enlightenment, but you could have enlightenment many different ways. It doesn't have to be because you believed in the Buddha and, le and learned 84,000 teachings. And in point of fact, just so everybody knows, only about 5% of the Buddhist teachings have even been translated into English. Right. And so, and so. Unless you if, know the original, if, like, yeah, right. Unless um, you can. Unless you can read it in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. um, right. Then, then chances are you haven't had the enlightenment experience that the Buddha had. Which but, is an argument to learn Sanskrit for those out no, there. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's, that's for our point, which is you don't have to learn Sanskrit to, uh, in order to have enlightenment. Okay. To have spiritual. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. And, I, to me is the, the generosity indication in the first half of his statement there actually to me is very, very strong where it is for the world that we have creativity instead of I have creativity for the world and I'm going to be so nice to give it. He's saying the generosity is in the first part. And there is that we are thankful. We are reverent to capital S self, not from ego, but for our ability to pull these things out and share them with our fellow people. Right. But we have to understand that there are many people in all societies who are not generous. Okay. Who are, Oh yeah. Who are that's very discernment. willing and happy to force you to do one, one thing or another. Um, and, Whoa. and so, um, you know, when people refer to um, uh, airy fairy, we have to remember that that life is in the eros. It's not in the logos. But people use the logos all the time to force us to do things that they want us to do that we may not want to do. This applies to all of us. We've all yes, had a it boss. does. Everybody has a boss that's an asshole. Okay, and so, <laughs> so, well, and um, the old quote of keep your friends close and your enemies closer. The fact is, your enemies will never, ever betray you. They're your enemies. They can't. But when you see Moses parting the waters of your enemies, that means incoming. So when you see your enemies who are closer, Moving away, that means someone close to you is coming in. There's incoming. So betrayal is actually smellable um, from that kind of keep your enemies closer piece. And I, I find that to be interestingly simple and often not said. Um, I've never okay. been betrayed. I've never been betrayed by an enemy ever. And I probably never will. And so anyway, that goes back to his number four. Right. And so um, reading this one more time, no. Four, right? Yes. Okay. Well, okay. Conceiving a plurality of spiritual liberations and ultimates not only is more generous in recognizing, but also can foster the infinite creativity of the spirit. But it's the infinite creativity of the spirit that we must learn to use in order to balance out um, the iron cage of the logos, okay? Because as soon as you have logos, as soon as you have structure, then you're, then you're being forced to live a certain way in a certain civilization, whatever it is. And so you have to balance that structure against the creativity of the spirit, what, what your psyche, what yourself is telling you to do. Um, so I mean, instead of inspect your expectations, it becomes always know how your own cage is constructed. Right. You may need to get out. 
I mean, <laughs> right. so, so. <laughs> uh, and so, so Miles says the bigger battle is not Christians against an, anti Christians or a Christians. Rather, the big battle is the interior battle of Christians calling each other, I am sheep, you are a goat. Yeah, well, that's certainly a battle uh, in, the, in the greater scheme of things. Oleg mm -hmm. says, we talk a lot about Buddha and Christ figures, but there are also interesting figures like Mani and Lao Tzu. Yes. Yes, uh, especially Bible Lao Tzu. Tell, you know, the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also to love our enemies, probably because generally they are the same people. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, the same people. That's that's even right. better. I like that because it integrates it. I mean, right. I, okay, you know, so. actually, I, I think I quote here from the founder of Aikido, Morahei Yoshiba. Yoshiba is is as apt. He he says, um, let me remember. Um, he says. When you focus on the good, in quotes, or bad of your fellows, you make an opening in your heart for maliciousness. Yeah. Testing, so, criticizing, and competing with people weakens and defeats you. So it, it's if you put your your head in there, it's going to get chopped off, basically. Well, um, Kushbu, what do you got? Kushbu has joined us, so uh, uh, what, Namaste, Kushbu. Uh, Kushbu is the young Indian woman who read the mm -hmm. Bhagavad Gita with me, and she said, "What's her comment? It's not a ca it's not cage, it's a chariot." And oh, that's even better. Yeah, oh, that's, that's even better because you run it, because you live in it, you move right. it. That's beautiful. Right. So it uh, is a chariot. Thank, thank you, Kushbu, for that piece of wisdom. Um, and that's like a that's like the importance of translation. Because yeah. cage, to ch thank you, Kushbu. Yeah. Is it Kushbu? Is that how to pronounce Kushbu, it? Kushbu, yeah. Kushbu. So okay. Max, thank you. Uh, Max says we are we all live in a box. Some boxes are bigger than others. Absolutely, that's that's uh, that's kind of where we're trying to get. We're trying to get a bigger box to well, live in. I had a meme recently with a cat that I had for twenty one years, and it was sometimes all you need is a good box. What box reinforces and enhances you? But I like I like Kushbu's chariot box, so to speak, better because that's that that makes a whole nother that really yeah, activates it is a that. chariot. And of course Yeah, that activates and that. Of course we've been Kushbu and I have been talking about the tarot and uh, the chariot card, which uh, you know people who don't know about the tarot think the chariot means a chariot moving through the um, through the wilderness but it's actually uh fixed <laughs> well it is it's the unmoved mover right i mean it's all the inner life so to me that i like that cage aspect with chariot yeah. with that inner life yeah, and oleg, fixed. oleg says chariot or a ship ship in the endless ocean of life so uh, to end this paragraph, then, um, uh, Federer says, I should stress here that I do not believe that either pluralism or universalism per se are spiritually superior or more evolved. And it is time now to make explicit the kind of spiritual universalism implicit in the participatory vision. Okay, and that is the tease for next week because there I'm, you go, I'm and to be continued. So we Stick just spent tuned. two hours covering two pages, and next week that's we'll pretty cover... fast, actually. Yeah, and so next week we'll try to cover the last two pages of this book, and meanwhile, I I am going to need help to converse with Dr. Ferrer. Uh, okay. we'll, give, we'll give everybody, including Jordan, an opportunity to ask one question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pose it in advance and I'll put it through so that he can just, you can. Well, no, I'm not going to censor your question. No, no, no. I just, I, I, I'm going to compose it in advance, though, because it's pretty simple. 
but I want it to be simple in a way that actually asks him what I would okay. like to know. This is the book, Participation yep. and the Mystery, um, Transpersonal Essays in Psychology, Education, and Religion by Jorge and Ferrer. It's published by uh, SUNY State University of New York University Press. And I think you can buy it on Amazon, but you can definitely mm -hmm. get it from SUNY Press. And uh, I copy a Rose Tuesday. So and I'll, I, I'll be... I urge all of you to get a copy of it and, and take a read. It's, a, it's twice as thick as the book we've been uh, reading. Here's, here's what we have been reading. And here's mm -hmm. what, here's the other book. I like so, that in the second one, he seems, feels more concise than in the first one and says then five times as much. Um, okay, and we're going to have we're going to have exactly two hours to talk with Dr. Ferreira. Um, that's and, why I'm going to submit my question by text because I'm not yeah. going to I'm not going to be responsible for limelight hogging time. Yeah, we have, and he's going to take an hour of it. So we have to be careful um, in terms of what we want to ask him. But uh, I'm sure that it's going to be a very powerful session. Yeah. And um, so if you want to be invited to that session, I'm going to put again on the YouTube uh, chat. That is the link. Uh, and you should gen, uh, join the Wisdom Path Colloquia mm -hmm. uh, so that you get the notices and you also get the link uh, from, uh, from me on where to find mm -hmm. this discussion on February the 7th at 1 p.m. Um, and to respect the gift of time, that's why I'm going to put my question specifically in an email text that can just be asked not by me so much, but put forth in such a way to get it out quick, clean, and then respect his time to find out his response. Well, because um, we'll, we don't I'll, have much I'll forward, time. I'll forward it to him so that he can. Yeah, I mean, so I don't. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to blindside him. So um, I'll get that early. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, we've done a two-hour session here. I think that's probably enough. <laughs> and particularly because in five hours time we have... Well, this is booster. empty now, so I have to go get another. It's What, what is that? You have to go. <laughs> this is empty. I have to go get another. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> From the right. kitchen. So, so. Um, uh, I may even shower and shave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, we have uh, Steve Buser coming on. Oh, that's at, right, this afternoon. Um, 3 o'clock Eastern PM, time? 3 p.m. Okay. And um, it, I will send out one more um, reminder about boot, uh, Dr. Buser's session. Uh, and I will probably do that about 1 p.m. So, And he's uh, dealing with Mary Louise von Franz, correct? Yep. He's yep. going to talk about the new series that Chiron Publications is starting tomorrow. As uh, I call which, her female which, young. Which is uh, her 106th birthday tomorrow. And um, nice. And so that's the date that they're going to start this. So if you haven't signed up and you want to participate in that discussion on Zoom, please uh, go sign up on the um, MailChimp, if you haven't already done so. And I have to say to Yuan, um, I, I hope you enjoy your ice cream. That yeah. sounded wonderful. And, and Manuela says, uh, wow, congratulations, Skip, on having Dr. Ferrer. I can tell you that it is no small trick because um, people of this eminence um, typically um, expect a... Um, uh, they expect a honorarium, it's an honorarium and, a, and I have no money for honoraria. And, and the honorarium usually has a comma in it. So, yeah, very often. And so I, um, uh, I, I have persuaded Dr. Ferrer to speak to us gratis, uh, which is the only way that they come on the wisdom path because, mm -hmm. but my rationale for that is that 
okay, in the academic circles or in the Carl Jung, um, the Jung Society of Washington, for example, uh, they can run a program and, you know, charge 25 or a hundred bucks for a session. Uh, I have made it a, a policy of mine not to charge for anything that I'm doing. I mean, I, I do have a little bit of income uh, from Patreon or from, uh, you know, people giving a 10 bucks or something on, on the super chat here, uh, which comes very rarely. <laughs> and and it, it actually cost me the money to run this activity, all these activities. And, um, and so I uh, don't have extra money to pay honoraria. And, but my point is that um, I'm also not holding myself out as something that, that I'm not. And so, you know, if you go to the Philemon Foundation mm -hmm. or the Young Society of Washington, it's perfectly appropriate for them to charge. Um, and it's not appropriate for me to charge because I uh, organize these sessions based on what appeals to me. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't have a specific attitude about what I want to put on this YouTube channel. And I even don't know. In fact, I don't have any idea what we've said in the last two hours. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I would like to say thank you for you making this gesture occur because I don't know if you know the, um, the series Carnival, but it, it reminds me of that Dust Bowl 30s preacher on the farmland out in the cornfield between seasons and there's a tent and the big guy from town comes in to speak. And so it's, it's one of those, I think, joyous graces where there's a gift of someone escaping from the silo in one sense, but also he's already liberated himself. And for him to come speak to us um, is a gift. And, and I, I think that also it's a larger community gesture um, from us to him and from him to us that um, I appreciate thoroughly that... Yeah. Um, well, you negotiate my point that. to him and people like him is that, um, okay, they, they're they well known. I mean, um, Ann Belford Ulanoff is another example, or mm -hmm. Murray Stein, you know, they're extremely well known in a very limited circle. Right. And, and what we're doing here is uh, pulling the roof off the silo and letting the seeds of wisdom blow out to the it, to, yes, dandelion it. Right. And so uh, I have no agenda. I have no idea what Dr. Federer may, might say or not say. Um, That's even better because yeah. we get him. I mean, what, what right. he's up to. Hey, dude, what's going on? And, you know, maybe not that casual a term, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Thank you, Manuela, for your comment. And uh, I think there's something called the Asterox Foundation that is selling itself on my chat. Search for Asterox Rising. Uh, so if you're interested in searching for that, please do. Uh, that I am not promoting that, but uh, the Asterox Foundation seems to be. So I don't know if it's worthwhile or not. <laughs> <laughs> random ad or actual yeah, random, random ad. ad or substance you never know sometimes yeah i never know <clears throat> okay peace i my voice is now gone and i have to pull it back together